addition to intellectuals in the White House. Um, and he'll be presenting tonight, of course, about Fight House, which is rivalries in the White House. In addition to that, Tevi has, is a former United States Department uh, Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services. He served in that position during the presidency of George W. Bush. And currently, he's the senior advisor for the Board of Experts at Levi's Partners. Prior to that, Tevi worked as the CEO of the American Health Policy Institute. So he brings a lot of varied experience, a lot of impressive experience to these presentations and to his role. Um, as a reminder about tonight's logistics, I will ask that you all remain muted during the presentation. You will have time afterwards to ask questions. If a question comes into your mind while he's talking and you don't want to interrupt, and we don't want you to interrupt, please feel free to put it in the chat box and I will be happy to either ask the question for you at the end of the presentation or unmute or ask you to unmute so that you can ask the question yourself. Again, I welcome Tevi to our program tonight. Thank you for being here. And Tevi, I'm going to ask you to unmute so that you can start your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Lynn, for that very nice introduction. I also want to thank my good friend, Carol Kelly, for um, making this little introduction and, and setting this whole thing up. Uh, Carol looks like she's enjoying some popcorn. I wish I could be there with you, Carol, in person to have some popcorn with you. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we're not, uh, we're not all out of this problem yet of the, uh, of the terrible pandemic. But uh, I look forward to when I do my next book doing an in-person presentation with all of you, which I think uh, I would enjoy more. And I, I hope you, well, I hope you enjoy this too, but uh, perhaps you would enjoy that more as well. And we can all share some good popcorn. So, I will remember that you offered that. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm playing around with book ideas right now. So, uh, but for now, I want to talk about Fight House. I don't know if people have uh, read it, but I've got a copy right here. You can take a look at the cover. It's kind of arresting. It's got a, uh, you know, an anonymous president. You don't know who it is, but he does have a long red tie. I mean, I'm just saying. And uh, he's got a little um, presidential uh, seal over there and boxing gloves as his tie clip. I know uh, people don't really wear tie clips that much anymore, but uh, anyway, I remember, and I'm sure many of you remember the generation when, when tie clips were, were a thing and uh, I like the boxing glove. Uh, so the, um, the idea for the book, I'll say came to me in late 2016, early 2017, there was a lot of discussion about the uh, chaotic approach of the Trump administration. that There's a lot of fighting within the AIDS, uh, both in the campaign and in the transition and then in the early days and indeed throughout the Trump administration. And I, we kept hearing these reports from the media saying, oh, there's unprecedented fighting in the Trump White House, unprecedented fighting. And I, I just kind of love that. I'm a presidential historian. And when I hear the word unprecedented, I go and look for precedent. So I just said, let me do a little exploration. Has, has there been fighting in other administrations? And to what degree? And uh, Lynn talked a little bit about my background. Uh, I am a presidential historian. I did my PhD in University of Texas where I focused on presidential history. My, uh, my dissertation advisor uh, was the, um, <laughs> Uh, was someone who'd worked in the Kennedy administration and her husband had been a national security advisor under Kennedy. And so I, I spent a lot of time studying the presidency. I've written four books on the presidency and I also worked in the White House. So I know a lot about White House history. But when I started looking into this subject, I was amazed at how much I didn't know, how many stories there were of people who were just absolutely killing each other uh, inside the gates, as they call it, or at the... Um, uh, at, at the 18 acres or, or inside 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I mean, all these stories of just really intense fights that had been taking place for years and decades. And you know, when you write a book, you need to find a way, I guess, to cabinet somehow. You can't cover absolutely everything. So I came up with this concept of from Truman to Trump because Harry Truman is really the first president to enter the White House with a White House staff. Before that, you had cabinet aides. And uh, even if you look back at the Franklin Roosevelt administration, he famously had the grains trusters. These are people who were super intellectuals who came to work in the, for the New Deal in, in the Roosevelt administration. But if you look at people like that, um, people like Raymond Moley and Rexford Tugwell, these guys, they actually worked at State Department, at Treasury, and at Agriculture. They didn't work in the White House. And this whole concept of a White House staff 
is something that really only develops as a result of the Roosevelt administration. Obviously, Franklin Roosevelt starts taking on all kinds of new responsibilities. He's fighting the Great Depression, there's New Deal, all kinds of new regulatory administrative agencies. And also he you know, ends up uh, fighting World War II. The US has a much bigger role in international affairs. And in the 1930s, before World War II, obviously, but in the 1930s, there is a commission. The commission is called the Brownlow Commission. And this Brownlow Commission looks into the administrative responsibilities of the president. And it comes up with a famous four-word conclusion. The conclusion is the president needs help. And it is out of those four words that they come up with this idea of a White House staff. And it, it's a, I love this line in, in the Brownlow Commission. It says that they should have these experts, advisors, people with a quote, passion for anonymity. Now, I know many of you have been following these issues for many years. It's, it's not like White House staffers want to stay anonymous these days. But uh, back then, the conception was that people with a passion for anonymity should come and serve the president. And so it does start under the late Roosevelt administration. But Harry Truman is the first president to enter the White House with a White House staff and has to figure out what to do with it, how to deal with it, and how to address this problem of infighting if there is to be any. And so uh, I started looking into this and I, it just found a fascinating history. Every single administration from Truman on had lots of infighting. You didn't always read about it in the paper. Sometimes you did read about it in the paper, but maybe sometimes you forget it. But it was just amazing to me that every administration had infighting. And in fact, I was listening to an interview with a guy named Peter Robinson, who was a Reagan speechwriter. He actually famously wrote the words, Mr. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And uh, this is a great uh, infighting story because uh, he wrote the words, but then the State Department excised them from the speech. And then he wrote them again, and the State Department excised it from the speech. And every time he wrote it, the State Department would knock the words out of the speech. And finally, what Robinson did was he circumvented the entire process, and he made sure that Reagan saw the words directly in a draft that it was not the way you're supposed to do things. You have to go through a staffing process and everybody's got to approve every document before it gets to the president. But he kind of snuck these words to the president so the president saw them and he said, I like that. And with the president on board, that's how those words, uh, Mr. President could tear down this wall actually ended up in the speech over the objections of the State Department. But this guy, Peter Robinson, he's being interviewed. And he says this line that just grabbed me. He said, of course there was fighting in the Reagan administration. We just didn't have Twitter, Twitter, Twatter talking about it. And that kind of gave me this idea for this book, which was, yes, there's always been infighting in the White House, but we just know so much more about it because of the nature of the media, the nature of people without a passion for anonymity, actually a passion for, uh, for fame and infamy, and the fact that there are so many more ways to get information today. Now, I read this story, amazing story, about Don Rumsfeld. He was the chief of staff in the Ford administration. And he tells a story about there's a lot of fighting in the, in, in, the, in the Ford administration. We could talk about that. But because of all the infighting, Rumsfeld decided that he was going to engage in this massive staff reorganization. It ended up beca becoming known as the Halloween Massacre. Rumsfeld moved to the Defense Department. Henry Kissinger, who was National Security Advisor and Secretary of State, the only person of both roles at once, he loses his national security advisor hat and becomes just secretary of state. Brent Scowcroft becomes national security advisor. Uh, Dick Cheney goes from deputy chief of staff to chief of staff. Nelson Rockefeller, who's the vice president, it's announced that he's out and not gonna be on the ticket in 1976. So all these big moves happen, but they're not announced yet. And Ro Rumsfeld is putting together this plan. And on a Sunday, he says in his memoir that he's planning on going to the Redskins game. Like that, I, can I say that Redskins? I mean, they used to be called the Redskins, uh, now the Washington football team, but back then they were called the Redskins. And so he's planning on going to the Washington football team football game. And he hears on a Sunday that Newsweek, the famous Newsweekly has the story of this planned staff shakeup. And Rumsfeld thinks about it for a moment. He says, okay, well, Newsweek has the story, but they go to press Thursday night and then the story won't come out till Friday. So. I have between now, Sunday and Friday to deal with this issue. And so I will go to the football game and enjoy myself. And then I'll figure out how to respond to the fact that Newsweek has this leak. It's just astounding to me. If you think about it today, 
if some reporter gets a leak like that, what do they do? They put it out on Twitter immediately. There's not, nothing stays secret for a week because Newsweek is waiting for its publication deadline. So we're in just such a different place today in terms of our knowledge of what's going on in the White House. So of course there's fighting in the Trump White House. There's tons of fighting. They're at each other's throats every day. But what I found in writing this book, Fight House, is that it had been happening in every administration. And that was the interesting thing. And the other interesting thing is, again, as a presidential historian, as somebody who's studied this, well, the White House, who's worked in the White House, I just kept finding stories about really nasty, undercutting, uh, unpleasant, uh, petty things that people were doing to one another, and I didn't know them. And I figured if I didn't know them, then the American people didn't know them either, and I thought it was worthwhile to put this together in a book. And so I go back and I do start with the Truman administration. And there's a great story in there in the Truman administration about the creation of the state of Israel. In the early days, the US did not know whether to recognize Israel. This is amazing to me. Right now, Israel is a very close ally and we've got a multi-decade partnership with Israel. But at the time, it was a real open question. Do you recognize the state of Israel? And not only was it an open question, but the entire national security establishment was opposed to recognizing the state of Israel. Harry Truman's president, and he says, well, I know all you national security guys, State Department, Defense Department, are against recognizing Israel, but I wanna hear a different perspective. And so he sets up a meeting in the White House where George Marshall, who's the Secretary of State and a guy who, Kissinger, uh, who Truman reveres more than anyone else in public life, and who was an important general in World War II, George Marshall is to make the case against recognizing Israel, adamant against recognizing Israel. In fact, he says that if Truman recognizes Israel, he won't even vote for him in the next election. I mean, that's really, a, uh, that's kind of a bold cl uh, claim to make in front of the president. But Truman asks another guy named Clark Clifford, who at the time was a junior White House aide. He later became more famous. He became the Secretary of Defense. He also got involved in a, a banking scandal later in the 80s. But at this time, he's a junior aide, very smart guy, lawyer, uh, got his uh, law degree from Washington University of St. Louis and was trained as a trial lawyer. And Truman says, make the case in front of all these national security people on why we should recognize Israel. And he prepares for it like the lawyer he is. And he's got briefs and he's got arguments and he's got an opening and closing and he's ready to go. And before he starts though, Marshall doesn't want to see it. He says, what's Clifford doing here? Kind of looking down at him over his glasses. What's Clifford doing here? He's a domestic policy aide and makes some kind of crack about domestic policy considerations shouldn't be involved in this. When he means uh, it's code, when you say domestic policy considerations, it's code for the Jewish vote. But he says, what's Clifford doing here? And Truman to his credit says, well, General, he's here because I asked him to be here. And we're gonna hear what he has to say about the, this question. And so Clifford makes this great presentation, says why we should recognize Israel. He wins the day, Truman recognizes Israel. But Marshall is so mad at Clifford that he never again speaks to Clifford or utters his name for the rest of his life. Now that's carrying a grudge. And when I would read stories about Trump administration aides who were so mad at each other, they wouldn't talk to each other, uh, which I thought was kind of petty and it is, I recognize that this is exactly what happened in the previous administration, what, ha what happened in the Truman administration. And so there's, what, what I kept finding was every time I would read a nasty story about something that happened in the Trump administration, there were all these historical precursors. These things had happened before. And it wasn't in Republican administrations that you had fighting. It wasn't Democratic administrations that you had fighting. It was every single administration. It was just, it's a common thing. And so I started to wonder why, why do you always have this infighting? You know, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, these are high stakes. Uh, these are high stakes questions. Uh, you have type A personalities. I used to say alpha males, but you know, alpha males and alpha females is now the case. Uh, you have um, a very tight quarters and the West Wing is very tight. You also have this dynamic. I was talking a little bit about the development of the White House staff. You have this dynamic of a advisor in the White House, who let's say is the national security advisor. And at the same time, you have the secretary of state. And both of them think that they are the primary advisor on foreign policy issues. And the national security advisor is standing next to the president. He's there in the president's ear all the time. The State Department guy is over at 23rd Street in Foggy Bottom. He's five blocks away. Those five blocks away might have been 20, you know, might as well be 50 miles away because the, the national security advisor is there. And that often gives him an edge. So I mentioned um, in, in the Nixon administration, I mentioned Kissinger earlier. Uh, Kissinger 
is the National Security Advisor uh, at the beginning of the Nixon administration, but he has a rival in the Secretary of State, a guy named William Rogers. Now Rogers is an old friend of Nixon, worked with Nixon in the Eisenhower administration. Nixon was vice president and Rogers was the attorney general. And Nixon stayed friends with Rogers throughout the 60s, including when he would come to Washington, Rogers would give him office space at, his, at Rogers' law firm. And so you think that Rogers, the kind of the senior guy, the former cabinet secretary, has all the advantages. But the truth is that Kissinger actually outmaneuvers Rogers at every turn because he's so sharp elbowed, he's so thin skinned, he's such a kind of a nasty uh, internal bureaucratic player. And you have all these stories in the Nixon administration of Kissinger just trying to outmaneuver Rogers in any way he can, including with the famous China initiative when Nixon reaches out to China. That's all in the hands of Kissinger. In fact, Kissinger creates three different briefing books for different people, depending on how much they're read into the program, whether they know that, that Kissinger is actually talking to China, when they know there's going to be a trip to China. And so different people get different books but, uh, based on what they know. And Rogers is left out of it. In fact, at one point, Nixon, Rogers, and Kissinger on a trip to India and Pakistan. And Kissinger passes, doesn't go to a certain meeting because he says that he has a, an upset stomach. And one of Rogers' aides makes a joke. He says, you know, I bet you Kissinger doesn't have, Henry doesn't have Delhi belly, but he's probably on a secret trip to China. And Rogers turns white because he recognizes that this is indeed what Kissinger was doing. He snuck off from the trip to go make a secret trip to China. And that's the first, uh, that, that's the first initiative with China. And so Rogers knows that, uh, that, that Kissinger is trying to outmaneuver him, that Kissinger is trying to leave him in the dark. And Kissinger was not above using some really nasty tactics. In, in fact, there's a great story that Kissinger at one point was dating Jill St. John, who uh, maybe, maybe some of you may remember her. She was an actress and a Bond girl very attractive Hollywood actress. And it appears in the press that Kissinger is dating this very attractive actress. And Kissinger blows a gasket. He goes to Nixon and he complains that Rogers, his rival at State Department, has leaked this information to the press. Now the truth is that Rogers never leaked the information. It was Kissinger who leaked the information. Why did he leak the information? I see Stephen over there is, is nodding. There's two good reasons. Number one is he wants everybody to know he's dating a Bond girl, right? You might as well, you know, if you, if you got it, flaunt it. So that's one. But the other is Nixon hated leaks. And he wanted, Kissinger wanted Nixon to think that Rogers was the leaker and that the leaks were all coming from State Department. Now, how do we know that Nixon hated leaks? He even created a special unit within the White House to address the leaks. What's the name of this special unit to address the leaks? They're called the plumbers. Everybody knows about the plumbers. The plumbers were the guys who ended up uh, engaging in the Watergate burglary, which Nixon probably didn't know about in advance, but he certainly helped cover up. And that ends up, his obsession with leaks destroys his presidency. But Kissinger knows that Nixon's obsessed with leaks and he plays off of Nixon's hatred of leaks in order to get this advantage, this bureaucratic advantage over Roger. So you really have these people who will, in a way, stop at nothing uh, to advance their own power. Sometimes you have people who are ostensibly friends who will be going at each other. It's, it's like, uh, you know, once you step in the White House, you kind of lose your, uh, you take an anti-friend pill or something is, uh, is uh, how Anthony Scaramucci described it. And he had people he thought were friends uh, going to the Trump White House and then they were trying to kill him once he was in the White House. So in the, um, there's a great story in the Carter administration, Cyrus Vance is a guy who was a senior aide uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense in the Johnson administration. And this big Brzezinski, brilliant academic who uh, was at uh, Harvard and then at Columbia. And they both are helping Carter out in 1976. And in fact, the two of them have dinner on election night, 1976 in an apartment in New York City. And they even leave the apartment together and they walk in, through New York City and they're talking about the prospects of them working together in the Carter administration when it happened. And indeed, they are both appointed to very senior positions in the Carter administration. Vance becomes the Secretary of State. Brzezinski becomes the National Security Advisor. On the first day, first day of the Carter administration, Brzezinski is shown his office. 
and he's shown his communications console. And there are two phones on his desk. And the national security aide says to Brzezinski, this phone over here rings from the secretary of state. And this phone over here rings from the president, from President Carter. And so Brzezinski points to the other phone, the one that rings from the secretary of state. And he says, yank it out, yank it out. I work for the president, not for Vance. First day of the administration, when here are guys who are ostensibly friends, but already Brzezinski is convinced that he is going to be uh, at, after Vance, and he is indeed, and they go at it hammer and tongs throughout the administration. In fact, there, there are jokes that the, um, the people at, the, at the, the State Department, when they talked about the enemy, they weren't talking about the Soviet Union. They were talking about the national security aides who worked under Brzezinski. So this is, again, a recurring theme, especially with Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. That's, that's a frequent kind of fight. But you had other kinds of fights in the Reagan administration, for example. You have uh, Jim Baker is the appointed the chief of staff. But Jim Baker comes from working for George H.W. Bush, who was Reagan's rival in the primaries and almost beat him. And, but Baker is a consummate political operator, very organized. He is well suited to be the chief of staff. But Reagan's got a guy named Ed Meese. And Ed Meese is Reagan's longtime aide from California, is kind of ideologically simpatico with Reagan. And he thinks that he's going to be the chief of staff. But Meese has a problem. He's terribly disorganized. In fact, Meese even has this briefcase that they would call the Meese case because papers would go in it and never come out again. And they, I mean, it's the only, in the, all of the uh, stories I found, it's the only object that actually got a nickname. There are lots of people who got na nasty nicknames, but the only object I got was the, the Mies case. And because of uh, Mies's uh, disorganization and because Baker and his allies are pushing this idea of how disorganized he is, Baker ends up becoming the chief of staff. Now Reagan knows that this will be a disappointment and he tells Baker, make it right with Ed. And so he gives Baker, uh, Baker gives Ed, uh, Ed Meese a, a, you know, a nice title and he gives him uh, a lot of seeming authority. But the way he sets it up is that Baker runs all the important offices and Meese kind of has these more general responsibilities. He gets cabinet ranks. So he gets to sit at the cabinet table, but he's not actually running things. And the two of them are rivals throughout the administration. And Baker is constantly leaking against Meese, who he calls the, um, the Pillsbury Puff Boy because Meese is a little overweight. And he's constantly telling the press how, um, how unprepared and how disorganized Meese is. And in fact, in 1981, when two US um, F-14 fighters shoot down two Soviet MiGs that were Libyan, Lib Libyan fighter jets, but they were from Soviet planes, um, it, it happens in the middle of the night in the US. And Meese, who's the counselor to the president, doesn't wake up Reagan. And this leads to a whole kerfuffle in the press. And uh, Baker takes advantage of this and he uses it to remove Meese from any foreign policy national security responsibilities. So Baker was always looking for an edge over Meese. And that's really the, the kind of consistent theme I found throughout the book is that you've got, you always have these people who are looking for an advantage in these internal bureaucratic wars. Now it's interesting, uh, these are some specific stories and I'm happy to take questions in a few minutes and talk about any administration you want. But what I found throughout this process, throughout the writing of Fight House, is that there are really three things presidents can do to control this infighting if they so choose. And that's an important caveat. If they so choose, they may not want to control the infighting. But there are three things you can go to try and limit the infighting. Number one is ideological alignment. If you have a team that's relatively ideologically aligned, you're gonna see less infighting. And indeed in the Bush administration, the one I worked in, uh, you had people on the domestic side, the foreign policy side is a different story, but on the domestic policy side, they were basically aligned on Bush's compassionate conservative vision. And you had less fighting on the ideology in that administration. It doesn't mean there was no fighting in the administration. There was certainly fighting on foreign policy and uh, Rumsfeld and Cheney and Powell were at each other's throats often. But when you have ideological alignment as they had on the domestic policy step, you're gonna see less fighting. The second thing is process. If you have a nice tight process where everybody knows what their responsibilities are and they don't step outside their lanes and the paper trail uh, goes in a smooth way and everybody gets to weigh in on things and people feel like 
regardless of whether they win at the end of the day, they had their voice heard, they had their seat at the table and they got to make their case, then you're going to have less infighting. But if you have a process that's a mess, like you did in, for example, the Ford administration, the Ford administration, there was a guy named Bob Hartman. Hartman was close to Ford and he sets himself up in the ante room outside the Oval Office. And from there, he monitors the presidential inbox. And if something comes in that he doesn't like, he removes it from the inbox himself and he'll leak it to Evans and Novak, who are the best known political columnists at the time. But if he wants to get something in there, if he wants something to go to the president, he shoves it in without going through the staffing process. I see Carol uh, smiling because she knows what the staffing process is and she knows how everything has to go through the the, the press, uh, the um, executive secretary's office or, or the um, staff secretary's office, depending on uh, wh what time you're talking about. But it has to go through this process where paper is assessed and everybody weighs in before reaching the president. If you have circumvention of the process, you're going to have more fighting, which you indeed did had in the, uh, in the Ford White House. And in terms of the third thing that a president does, the third lever a president has for controlling infighting, if they so choose, is presidential tolerance. Obama, for example, he didn't want to see fighting. He made it clear. He had this nickname of no drama Obama. It was part of his shtick. It was his idea. We're not going to have fighting in this White House like we've had in previous ones. And he would call people on the carpet if they stepped out of bounds. So for example, there's one story I tell in the book of a woman named Alyssa Mastromonico. She was deputy chief of staff. And at one point, she didn't like what somebody said in an anonymous quote about her to the New York Times. And there is an email where this article is sent to the entire Obama senior staff. And she sent a blistering response, reply all to everybody complaining about how your colleagues shouldn't be leaking against you and how dare people say this about her and blah, blah, blah. Now, the truth is it wasn't that negative a mention, but whatever, she was not happy with it. And the next day, Obama calls her into the Oval Office. Not that unusual. She's a deputy chief of staff. They get called into the Oval all the time. And he looks at her as she walks in and she says, and he says, that's quite the email you sent. You don't have to say anymore. It was clear that he didn't want to see infighting in, among his staff. Now, that doesn't mean there was no infighting in the Obama White House, and I talk about some of the infighting, but there was less of it because the president made clear he didn't want it. You know, in the Trump administration, here's a guy who said, I like conflict. So he was somebody who's willing to have infighting. And there's a great, great story I have in the book where during the campaign back in 2016 on Trump Force One, you have A.J. Delgado, and Hope Hicks, two female aides, are flanking Trump on the plane and they're yelling at each other. Trump is in between them, he's reading the New York Times. I know he says he doesn't read it, he reads it. So he's sitting there reading his paper, these two women are screaming at each other. He lowers the paper, looks at the two of them and he goes, cat fight! And then he lifts the paper back up and keeps reading. Now there's a president who's willing to tolerate infighting on his staff and that's, a, and that's indeed what you saw. So again, presidents are going to see infighting. Infighting isn't something you can completely eliminate, but there are ways to manage it and limit it. And those are the three levers that I found in the book. And I also feel from my work in Fight House that these lessons, they work for the White House, but they also really work for any organization. Any CEO can look at these lessons. Anyone who runs an organization can look at these lessons and really try and use them to manage and control infighting in, in your organization because it's part of the human condition. People will be rivals one, with one another. But if you can set things up the right way, if you can foster more communication and more cooperation, you're gonna get better results. And that's really the lesson of Fight House. I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much. There are some great stories there. I look forward to reading the book and hearing the rest, seeing the rest of them. Um, I don't have any in the chat, however, I will, just give me a second. And anybody who is interested in um, asking a question, perhaps about any of the administration. Looks like Carol does. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, uh, first, okay. first, let me thank you, Tevi, for joining us tonight. That was tremendous. And uh, I first met Tevi when he was deputy secretary at HHS to then Secretary Levitt. So in addition to being a presidential author, he mentioned his White House term, but also he made tremendous contributions at HHS, which is where we met. So thank you very much for uh, everything you've done in public service and for joining us this evening. A question for you. 
Uh, I know you haven't studied Joe Biden yet. He's only been in the White House for what, about 50 days now. I thought it was incredibly interesting that the, you know, the day he's inaugurated, he swears in a thousand people, right, on Zoom. And he's trying to set a tone and tenor, I think of collegiality so that you get away from some of this infighting. I know you haven't studied him yet, but I know you observe these things. So what do you see so far in uh, the Biden administration and how people are working with one another? Yeah, it's a great question, Carol. And it was really great to work with you and uh, appreciate all your public service and appreciate you bringing me here this evening. It's a fantastic question. There's a really interesting story to be told with the Biden administration. If you look back, they were now in March, but if you look back about 18 months ago, in September or October, of uh, 2019, so before they, they start voting in the primaries. And you've got um, the Biden campaign is running, but not doing well at all. I mean, you know, he's president now, but people forget he was on his last legs. People were making fun of him that, you know, he shouldn't have come back. It was, he was not in good, uh, in, in good shape. Uh, the campaign was having money trouble. I mean, it looked like Biden wasn't going anywhere. And <clears throat> There was tumult within the senior staff, so much so that they couldn't even agree on a Biden agenda. They kept talking internally about, let's put out, you know, this is what we're for, this is our agenda. They never could agree on it because there was so much internal fighting, which I think is a really interesting story. Now you fast forward a few months to the beginning of 2020, it looks like Bernie Sanders is going to uh, win the nomination because he wins the, the first two primaries. And then suddenly the Democratic establishment uh, and led by James Clyburn in, um, in South Carolina, they unite behind Biden and Biden starts winning every primary and Biden has this clear path to the nomination. And so suddenly when there's trouble, when there's stress within the Biden team, there's infighting. But once they, you've got this smooth sailing and there it pretty much is smooth sailing, he kind of walk, cakewalks to the nomination after Super Tuesday, suddenly things smooth out in Biden world and you see less infighting. And there's also a unifying internal factor of their hatred for Donald Trump and desire to get Donald Trump out of office. And this is something we've seen before in the Clinton administration, the first term, there's a lot of infighting in Clinton's first term. But in the second term, uh, when you had in, in, in some ways more chaos, you had the Monica Lewinsky scandal and uh, you had impeachment as a result. And there was actually less infighting in the, in the Clinton administration in that second term. And there's a great interview that I have in the book uh, with Ann Lewis, who is Barney Frank's sister, and she was a, an aide, a White House aide under Clinton. And she's asked about the, whether there's infighting in the second term and whether people are kind of splitting over the question of Lewinsky and, um, and Clinton's inappropriate relationship with her. And she says, you want me to side with Henry Hyde, with Newt Gingrich? So she makes it clear with Ken Starr, she makes it clear that the internal, um, the internal fighting is diminished in recognition of the external enemy. And so they kind of unify in the Clinton administration, even in a tumultuous time, because they hate the opposition, the Ken Stars of the world so much. And so I think we see a similar dynamic within Biden world, especially during the campaign. And you see this, um, uh, this, this real unity within the Biden team, you see very little stories of infighting during the campaign. And obviously they ran a successful campaign and he's now president. And I think for the most part, we haven't seen that much infighting because again, they, they've been quite unified in trying to get this first bill through the, um, the, the kind of coronavirus package, $1.9 trillion. And the unity I think has limited the infighting, but when there is tumult, when there is challenges, when there's stress, you do see um, some creaking at the seams and you may see more as things get more complicated. So for example, uh, there's a woman named Neera Tandon. She was nominated to be the director of the Office of Management and Budget. She is someone who wrote many, many nasty tweets over the years. And I get it, there've been other people who've written nasty tweets who elevated to high positions in government, uh, including the president, but other people. But the thing about Tandon's tweets is that they were nasty and directed at United States senators. It'd be like going up for a job interviewing, an interview and having said nasty things about the people you're interviewing. I mean, the very people who have to confirm her are the ones that she said nasty things about. And I think that's more than anything else what, what hurt her. But within the Biden White House, which we started to see articles about this challenge and some of the infighting that resulted and people were uh, 
for the first time, you're seeing negative uh, anonymous quotes from within the administration uh, directed towards Ron Klain, who's the chief of staff in the Biden administration, who you know, is a very competent person, gets, generally gets high marks, but people were criticizing him for having backed Tandon and for having pushed for nomination. And in fact, there's this great quote in a recent Washington Post article that said it was Ron, 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 by an anonymous person within the Biden White House indicating that there's some dissatisfaction internally over that. So I think the, uh, the arc of the Biden administration is interesting from the early infighting to the subsequent unity. And now we're gonna see as things get tougher because things always do get tougher in administration once you're done with the initial honeymoon period, uh, you'll see if, if more infighting emerges. But I will say that Biden said on his first day that if people speak disrespectfully or in nasty ways to one another, they're gonna be gone immediately. And we had a test case of this with a guy named TJ Ducklow, who is a press aide who uh, got in kind of an ugly fight with a reporter and threatened to ruin her. And when Biden heard about this, they, they suspended Ducklow for a week without pay. And then he came back, but his reputation was damaged and it was kind of untenable that he left shortly after. So he had a very, very short White House tenure. Uh, you know, I think from based on my own experience, if Biden really holds the standard of anybody who speaks disrespectfully is going to be out of the White House, yeah. he's going to get rid of everybody really fast. Because there's, you know, sometimes there's rough language in, in the White House and people, you know, sometimes you'll see tempers elevated. But I think there's a difference between speaking disrespectfully once and having a reputation as being a nasty infighter. And I think uh, if he'll go after the people who, uh, who are serial misbehavior, misbehaviors, it's much better than just saying, oh, one person made one mistake one time and they're out. So that, that's my thought on your question, Carol. Thank you. I saw um, that uh, Sally had a question also. Yes, she did. Sally, uh, you're up. Yes, thank you. I, I love the presentation and I, I'm also a big fan of West Wing and I've gotten to the point <laughs> I've been watching a lot of the reruns and uh, it's very interesting. They don't seem to have the kind of clashes <laughs> that you're talking about. So maybe that's a, a, a comment on their credibility. They seem to handle it with more good humor and uh, cooperation. And, but, and it's fiction. <laughs> well, well, it's fiction, but a lot of the, I mean, I, I've had a long history of working with you know, in government, with government in, in Washington. And I mean, there's a lot of it that's true too. And, but uh, anyway, I, it's a great show. Uh, but I'm curious about how you, um, how you gathered your information. What kind of research did you do? What kind of sources did you use? Because I would think in some cases, people are reluctant to talk about those histories. It's a great question. I will say that one of my secret weapons in writing this book was the Miller Center Oral History Project. Now this is uh, with Miller Center University of Virginia. And what they do is very clever. They will interview people at the end of an administration and they'll say, oh, this won't come out for 10 years. So people feel a little more loose about what they're willing to say because they, oh, it won't come out for 10 years. Well, 10 years after, I mean, I know on, uh, in 2019, when the Bush administration oral histories came out, I looked immediately to see what we were doing. I know it was 10 years later, but still quite curious. So I think people were kind of open in that, but um, I, you know, I'm a trained historian. I used a variety of sources, including uh, memoirs, which I think were great. Um, a lot of journalistic books, including um, uh, memoirs by journalists. Like uh, uh, I mentioned uh, Bob Novak earlier with the Evans and Novak column. His, his um, not only was his memoir, Prince of Darkness, great, but uh, I looked at his old columns because they often had a lot of stuff about some of the nastiest fights that were going on. And it's interesting that in my publisher, the, the guy who bought the contract for the book and was the publisher uh, is the son of Bob Novak. And so he really appreciated, not only appreciated that I used a lot of stuff from his father, but he even wrote the forward to the book, which is unusual for your publisher to write your forward, but I still uh, appreciate that. So um, uh, there was that, there was all, you know, pre standard presidential biographies are, you know, they don't give you everything, but they get and give you a direction to go. They will let you know what some of the big fights were, and then you can go find more details. Um, some original journalistic sources, I was looking a lot at the you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, uh, at the time uh, was very helpful. But one thing I did not do was interviews. I'm very skeptical of historians who do interviews in general. Uh, I'm fine with you know, somebody who wants to do interviews for news media or whatever, but I think for historians, there's a real danger because let's say I interview somebody, let's say I interviewed Powell and Rumsfeld in the Bush administration. And let's say, I'm just saying, let's say Rumsfeld got the, the better of the 
fights most of the time, or maybe he was on the right side um, and, and Powell wasn't. But let's say I met, I met both of them and Powell was more charming than Rumsfeld was less charming or Rumsfeld was rude or nasty to me. I think that colors your view as an interviewer. So I was really wary of that. I also think sometimes people are not necessarily honest uh, with interviewers if they know what the subject is. And so I want, and I also, this is really important. I wanted my sources to be available and transparent to everybody. So if you, you, you can read my book, you can read Fight House and disagree with my conclusions. You can disagree with my analysis, but you really can't trust, trust my, uh, you can't question my sources. You can't say, oh, well, he had some kind of secret interview in a hotel room with uh, you know, James Baker and uh, there's no evidence that Baker actually said that, it's just his words. There's none of that in my book. Every source is documented. So it's all, there's kind of a neutrality of sources and, and I really wanted to go for that. And I've used that, that approach with every book and I found it serves me well. Good question. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? I don't see any hands electronically raised, but perhaps people would like to raise uh, a real hand, if you will. Uh, Tevi, while, while other people are thinking of questions, I have another one, if it's okay, Lynn. Sure, thank you. Thanks. Um, you mentioned, Tevi, the news cycle early on in your presentation and the tension among White House staff. Do you think, and you're almost hinting that earlier, that the way the news cycle works so quickly these days, it almost makes these rivalries more difficult to control. Just um, asking if basically if the way media works now and has evolved makes the situation of tension in the White House worse in your view. I think we know more about it as a result of the news cycle. And I think that sometimes knowing more about it leads to it being worse. I think the more you read about this, you know, there's a great article in Sports Illustrated a couple of years ago about the 1978 Yankees. This is a team that was losing by 13 and a half games um, in June or July around the All-Star break to, to the Red Sox. And everyone said they had no chance of winning. And they went on a tear in late July, August, and September. They ended up winning the division. They made the playoffs. They, they won the World Series. And the Sports Illustrated article looks back at that summer. And it kind of identifies the day, it was late July, when they started winning. And they said that the day in which they really turned it around was the day when the New York City newspaper strike began. And suddenly all these tabloids, the Daily News and Newsday and the New York Post, they stopped writing all these nasty articles about different people who were fighting with each other on the Yankees. And the team kind of gelled after that moment because they didn't have the, the news media kind of writing, oh, these guys hate each other. And I think it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think it is true that if you're reading more about it in the press about how two people are hating each other, then uh, the, the people will be uh, more inclined to dislike the other person and more inclined to say, what, am I, what, am I, what can I do to get him? So I, I think that is part of it. But I also think that there was lots of infighting in the past that we just didn't know about at the time, kind of back, back to that uh, Peter Robinson quote about Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. We just know more in real time about what's going on than we did in the past. I, I see um, Alan has a question yes, he about a um, presidential memoirs. Right, how valuable are presidential memoirs, example, those written by Obama, Clinton, et cetera, are they going? And then he follows up with the question, are they going to write about the infighting? So, Basically, presidential memoirs are largely useless for this project. Um, presidents often just undersell how much infighting was going on. They, they, they don't want to say, oh, yeah, my, my staff was at each other's throats. Uh, they were trying to kill each other and you know, I couldn't control stuff. So for the most part, you know, I might get some directional stuff. So I looked at Obama's memoir and he mentions that there was more infighting in his administration than the media reported on. So, you know, it's a little bit interesting, but in terms of the details, the nasty things, the people uh, leaking uh, against one another, or people uh, not speaking to one another, that stuff doesn't come up in the presidential memoirs for the most part. I have a question. I have a question. Yeah, Arlene. Arlene. I'm Arlene Holland. We actually work together. In the Bush yes, I remember. Um, wouldn't you, uh, based on your statement that uh, where there's, where there's uh, more ideological uniformity, uh, and less, they would, you'd expect less conflict. Well, based on that, I'd expect to see a lot of conflict in, in, the, uh, in the Biden administration 
because they have a lot of, they have very wide ideological bridges to gap, gaps to bridge. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely you right. I do, Would you expect that? I do expect fighting based on that, but I haven't seen that much evidence of it. So, right, so cause we're just at the beginning. Right, we're still at the beginning, but yeah, I think there are, uh, I think there's real divisions between the kind of the moderate wing in the Democratic Party and the, and the woke left. And right. um, so I, I think there will be in fighting. But also, Arlene, you raise a really interesting point, which is more comedy leads to less infighting, which is a good thing in general, but yes. it can be overdone. Let's look at the Lyndon Johnson administration. Lyndon Johnson didn't want to see any infighting, didn't want to see people disagreeing with him in any way, didn't brook challenges to his positions or his authority within his staff. And that led to real problems with the Vietnam War and groupthink and the sense that everybody was basically on the same page and you really couldn't question the Vietnam policy. And in fact, there was a collection of aides at the State Department who were skeptical with good reason of the Vietnam policy, but they were terrified of Johnson. So they created a little collection of aides called the non-group. They didn't want to call themselves a group and they met secretly so that Johnson wouldn't know about it. They wouldn't know that anybody was questioning his, uh, his approach to the Vietnam War. So I think if you stifle debate, right. you may say, oh, well, there's less overt infighting, but you may get worse policy decisions. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, this was a great talk. Thank you so Thank much. You. It's a wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Tom, uh, please unmute. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really fascinated by this uh, presentation. Um, my question has to do with, uh, there have been uh, several administrations that where there are sort of a pair um, of, uh, of, of advisors in the White House. And I think of um, Cheney and Rumsfeld, actually who kind of leapfrogged off, off of each other through more than one administration. Also Haldeman and Ehrlichman, who are you know the pair that kind of come to mind with the Nixon administration. Um, I wonder if you've got any great stories about them, but also do those kind of pairings um, lead to better collaboration or is there more sort of um, kind of collusion going on that uh, is, is it uh, to the president or uh, to, to the advantage or disadvantage of the president who's got these two uh, there you know, in the Oval Office with them? Thank you. Yeah, well, it's, it's a great question, Tom, but uh, you know, Haldeman and Ehrlichman is not a model I'd follow since they, uh, they both ended up in uh, serious legal tro uh, trouble, including uh, prison sentences. So uh, that's not um, something to uh, model. Um, with Cheney and Rumsfeld, uh, yeah, I mean, they were closely aligned and, and I think they got a lot done. Uh, you know, you can question uh, the, uh, some of the policy choices such as the Iraq war in the, in the Bush administration, but uh, I, I think sometimes you can, um, have, if, you, if you've got someone who really watches your back and you watch their back and you're working together, you, you can get a lot done. But I think also um, it, it can lead to challenges as well. And I think in this case of uh, John Sununu and Dick Darman in the George H.W. Bush White House. They were both very smart. Uh, they were a little too convinced of how each smart one was, how smart each one was because Darman, the 40 year old adult male used to brag about his SAT scores and Sununu used to brag about his IQ score. So, I mean, it was smart, but maybe something psychologically off about them. And they would sit there in the senior staff meetings in the morning, there'd be a long oval uh, table in the Roosevelt room. So let's say about 20 people around the table. Darman's on one side, Sununu's on the other. And they would berate anyone who dared to raise any issues that they didn't agree with. And um, they, they would kind of team up and yell at the staff. And uh, Darman in particular was a, was a pretty nasty and, and very sharp fellow. And uh, they called uh, this process of being humiliated at the senior staff meeting, it's called being Darmanized. And um, it, the problem was that in the George H.W. Bush administration, uh, you really had uh, a, a freeze in new thinking and original thinking of domestic policy. And obviously Bush uh, wins the first Gulf War, has a, a approval rating almost in the 90s after that, but um, really has no domestic agenda. And that starts to hurt him and his approval ratings start to go way down and Clinton challenges him and Bush seems out of touch on domestic policy issues in large part because they weren't having good discussions internally about domestic policy issues because Darman and Sununu were berating anyone who tried to come up with new ideas, including a guy named Jim Pinkerton, 
who came up with a group of ideas called the New Paradigm. And Darman famously mocks Pinkerton's ideas. He calls it, brother, can you paradigm? And uh, he kind of threatens Pinkerton and puts Pinkerton in a very bad situation and leaks it against Pinkerton in the press. And, uh, and you know, when you see that kind of thing, you're not going to stick your head up and try and come up with new ideas because you know you're just going to get humiliated by Darman. And it leads to a situation where, where Bush really has no interesting uh, policy thinking in the last couple of years, or domestic policy thinking in the last couple of years of administration, and, and it really suffers. And what's really interesting is that the new paradigm ideas, there was actually some political resonance to them because most of them were ideas that were later adopted by Newt Gingrich and was known as the contract from, uh, for America. And that helped the Republicans win the House back in, in 1994. So uh, it's not that the new paradigm ideas were bad, it's that Darman didn't want to hear any ideas that weren't his, and he was enabled by Sununu. So I think sometimes these pairings are problematic, uh, but they can be successful if you have perhaps less, less nefarious characters, let's say. Thank you. Uh, there, let me just take a check, see if there's any other questions. Yes, Richa. This is not a question, but I just have to say that I have been admiring Warren's t-shirt. I hope everyone has noticed it. That's great. Thank you, Warren. Excellent. <laughs> um, I did have a question. Uh, I assume that a uh, president's personality plays a role not so much in whether there is infighting, but how it's manifested. And given the fact that maybe a little bit too close to the Trump administration in terms of time, but one of uh, Donald Trump's clearly prime values that he holds is loyalty. And I'm wondering what kind of impact uh, that kind of uh, personality, that aspect of a uh, president's personality can impact how much infighting there is and how it's manifested. Yeah, I, I don't know if um, I agree with the assessment about Trump valuing loyalty. I, I know he says he values loyalty, but um, he doesn't show it hasn't showed it to people. I mean, if you know, somebody gets in trouble, they would be dropped pretty quickly. I mean, I felt like Bush had a better, George W. Bush from where I worked, had a better sense of loyalty in that it's a two-way street, that he will stick with you and have your back, but he also knows that you're not going to be leaking against him. So I think that's a better way of looking at loyalty. I, I know Trump, you know, would have his kind of loviating uh, with James Comey, you know, are you going to be loyal to me stuff. Um, but that's more like, you know, it's more like mind games, I think, than, than a true understanding of the virtue of loyalty. Um, so I, I don't mean to um, second guess the, the question, but I, I, I just, when, when I think of loyalty, I don't necessarily think of Trump's approach. Now, uh, I think the personality does make a difference. Uh, we talked a couple of times about the Ford administration, so 895 days of the Ford administration, which is, which is a short administration, and the most rivalrous one that I encountered. Uh, let, let's put Trump aside because Trump, uh, I don't have, I didn't have access to the archives and the oral histories for Trump. So I don't really, I don't do a deep dive in the Trump administration at the White House like I do with all the other administrations. But of the ones that I really had the sources and, and did an analysis of, uh, Forge was the most rivalrous. And, and I started to think about why. And the reason is if, any, if you ask anybody, what do you think of Jerry Ford? Tell me something you think of Jerry Ford. They always said the same thing, nice guy. Everybody said nice guy, even Trump, even Ford himself in 1976, there uh, his political consultants are talking about, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what defines you? What, what do you really want to accomplish in your second term? What, what are you about? And he he couldn't come up with anything. He said, "I like people." Well, great. Okay, so he's a nice guy. But the niceness, the very niceness, I think, is something that harmed him, because he was unable to control the staff infighting that was taking place. And in fact, this guy Hartman, who was a real issue, a real problem in the administration. Um, I hope it's okay if I use a, a little, um, a somewhat off color word, but I'm just quoting the historical record. He says to, uh, he says to Ford, Harbin says to Ford, you know, your problem is you don't think ill of anybody until they kick you in the balls three times. And so I think Ford let people get away with too much stuff because he was such a nice guy. And so I do think the president's personality makes a difference, uh, but in a weird way. I mean, you, you think, who do you want to hang out with? I want to hang out with a nice guy, but who do you want to be president? Yeah, maybe somebody who's a little tougher than that. Good question. Good question and good answer. Thank you. 
Um, so our next program is actually a perfect follow-up to this because it's called Contested Histories. And what we're going to be talking about, and you are welcome to join us, is how the art in the museum kind of informs the historical narrative. And we're going to look at Pickett's Charge and some other artworks and how they are portraying history and whether it's accurate or not so accurate. So those of you joining us today are definitely invited back. This is March 24th at 5.30. Uh, it's called Contested Histories and it's with Nancy Hirschbein, museum docent and founder of Dial a Docent. And I know that you join me in thanking Heavy Toy for this fabulous and very interesting evening. Uh, I think you've sold a lot of books tonight because I know we're all going to run out and want to read it and uh, learn more. And I look forward to seeing you in person when you write your next book. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I'll definitely do that. And let me just say, I really appreciate speaking to an audience that knows of what I'm speaking, meaning they're aware of the historical record. Sometimes I speak to um, uh, to student groups or younger people and they like, they look at me blankly. Who's Jerry Ford, let alone who's um, who's Don Rumsfeld? And uh, you know, it's really great to talk to people who who understand uh, what, what I'm talking about and have a kind of reference set for, uh, for the conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Tevi. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Liz.